Uh, in this lecture we will be uh, looking at a specific uh, spectroscopy tool uh, which has been widely used in materials chemistry and uh, as the title suggests there are two issues that are involved in this spectroscopy. Uh, the name uh, suggests that it is a x-ray photo electron spectroscopy therefore, um, there is a x-ray that is produced uh, when a photo electron is ejected. So, a combination of uh, uh, two processes that are happening brings about a very rich chemistry that one can learn. Material scientists, uh, physicists and chemists have used this technique uh, extensively and uh, this is uh, uh, now a very established tool for characterization materials uh, in the last three decades. Uh, improvised and very sophisticated instruments have come. Um, in the uh, in the last two decades, uh, the machine could actually occupy a very big room, uh, but today uh, the sophistication of this instrumentation has uh, moved such a way that even a bench top x-ray photo electron spectrophotometer can be used. So, we will look into the, uh, this issue of what this uh, principle behind the spectroscopic tool is. And, uh, if there is something very highly complementary to x-ray diffraction, it is the spectroscopic tools. And as you would see in this lecture, there are several spectroscopic issues that are manifested when x-rays are emitted and how this can be mapped and how we can uh, translate this into quantifying some results, we will see in the next few slides. And uh, uh, to start with let us see uh, how we create x-rays and uh, how the spectrum of a x-ray tube uh, is generated. Now, when a incident electron beam is uh, incident on a core electron that is in the k shell, then there are several things that can happen. Uh, electron can be ejected out of the, uh, to the vacuum level, which means it is totally out of the um, binding force or binding energy of the metal or it can actually have a electron loss energy um, situation that is involved um, or uh, electrons can be produced uh, x-rays can be produced from one of the L shells to uh, a K shell when a electron jumps from one to the other. So, we can actually look at the particular x-ray that is produced during this transfer of uh, this electron from L shell to K and that can be a characteristically mapped for a particular element. And this is the characteristic radiation that one uh, observes uh, which has two components K alpha and K beta, but usually we try to use K alpha because the intensity of K alpha is much higher than K beta. So, we will now look at the process that involves uh, generation of x-rays which is typical of a material and uh, uh, this has to do with the core uh, shell electrons uh, instead of the valence uh, band uh, electrons. Therefore, uh, this is particularly called as x-ray photo electron spectroscopy. Now, when we uh, look at uh, this uh, analysis tool, uh, it is mainly classified or uh, generally referred to as surface analysis and uh, the study of the outermost layers of materials can be studied. Therefore, in thin film may be through the bulk, but in the bulk materials you can only penetrate to very few nanometers. Therefore, it is mostly a surface phenomena rather than a bulk phenomena that we can look for, but generally this can bring about rich chemistry because all the impurities that are occluded to a given uh, bulk material can be analyzed because the uh, depth uh, that it can go is only for few nanometers. Now, depending on the manifestation of the interaction of the beam with the sample, there are several things that can happen. One is based on the electron spectroscopy and another one is based on ion spectroscopy. So, a series of characterization tools can emerge out of um, the approach that we take. If you are going to use a electron beam to interact, 
then the manifestations are XPS that is X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy or another secondary process that happens during the XPS which is Auger electron spectroscopy or there could be another secondary effect which is a electron energy loss spectroscopy. All this when uh, electron beam is interacting with the core shell um, electrons. We can also have um, ion interaction with the matter and as a result we can uh, come across uh, several uh, spectroscopic tools which can carry useful information. One is a SIMS that is secondary ion mass spectroscopy can give you very refined um, information into all the um, corresponding elements or impurities that are present in the surface or the Rutherford backscattering which is another very sophisticated tool where helium ion is sent into the lattice and if the lattice is actually ordered then you have a good channeling that is happening. But if it is a disordered material the helium ion will get scattered back and therefore you can look at the length of this ordering of the lattice or how orderly the lattices are developed during the process can be mapped and specially those who are involved in thin film technology use RBS as a very very uh, sophisticated tool which can give you a clear insight into the epitaxial growth of the film whether the film is growing along a particular axis or not can be mapped using RBS and then you also have ion scattering spectroscopy. So, a range of spectroscopic tools are categorized in the form of surface analysis and today we will look little bit more deeper into the XPS technique. So, what is XPS? X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is actually based on the photoelectric effect that is why it is called X-ray photoelectron uh, spectroscopy and this was developed in mid 60 by Kai Saiban um, and his research group at the University of Uppsala in Sweden and since then uh, this, um, this has been a pioneering uh, probe tool. Uh, so, what is uh, XPS and how historically we can identify this? 1887 it was actually uh, the discovery of photoelectric effect and uh, this was not uh, explained based on classical physics because um, what we saw from uh, the photoelectric effect was common not commensurate to the theory uh, that was existing about light. So, in 1905 it was uh, Einstein who used the uh, issue of uh, quantization uh, proposed by Max Planck and he explained what this photoelectric effect means and uh, the first formulation of basic uh, XPS theory by Rutherford in 1914 and then photoelectron spectra of different elements were recorded in 1920 and then on it has been a major effort uh, as a surface probe tool. Now, what really happens in the photoelectric process? As you would see the incident x-ray actually falls on the core shell electron that is K shell and this is immediately ejected as a photo electron. So, this is the photo electron that we are trying to map, but in the process there are several things that can happen once the hole is created here then the neighboring uh, shells that is in the L1, L2 or L3 will quickly translate one of the electrons to the lower elect, uh, lower shell that is K uh, shell and uh, thereby secondary processes do emerge. So, XPS spectral lines are identified by the shell from which the electron was ejected. It could be from K shell or L or M and so on. The ejected photo electron has a kinetic energy which is uh, H nu minus binding energy minus phi and this is actually from the instrument. We will look at uh, this equation because we are familiar with this expression from photoelectric effect which is your work function plus half m v square. This is your basic uh, expression from photoelectric effect, but what you would see here is an extra parameter that is coming which we will try to understand as to why we do that. Following this process the atom will release energy by emission of an 
Auger electron. So, where this Auger electron is coming into picture the L electron falls to fill the uh, vacancy which is step 1. So, once the photo electron is uh, ejected out from uh, which was from here it the photo electron was ejected and in that place one of the L 2 or L 3 electrons will actually come and fill this place and to conserve energy one of the other electron will be emitted. As a result you are actually getting a Auger electron which is actually not the photo electron which was, which was ejected in the first step. Therefore, two different processes do occur one is Auger electron which is coming and the other one is the photo electron uh, x-ray photo electron. So, the kinetic energy of the Auger electron is actually different from the kinetic energy of the photo electron. In photo electron we are bringing in other phi when this binding energy is also a work function of the sample this is typical of the sample and this is typical of the machine or the electron gun which will come to it. Therefore, there are two work functions that are related when we talk about uh, XPS we are talking about the kinetic energy of the Auger electron which is linked to the energy of the electrons in different levels. So, both are different the, the information that you get is different. So, the X-ray induced Auger electrons uh, can be uh, actually mapped in this way. So, when uh, when we have this X ray photo electron then the electron actually is ejected from the core shell and this the uh, core shell electron which has gone. Uh, so, that means the binding energy is the energy that we go from here to the valence band and from valence band uh, to the vacuum level. So, uh, that is your uh, energy that is associated with the kinetic energy of the um, ejected electron and uh, when we think of the Auger electron it is the energy that is translated from one of these shells to uh, the vacuum level. So, the kinetic energy of the Auger electron therefore, is going to be completely different or will be less than the kinetic energy of the photo electron. However, the kinetic energy is actually independent of the X-ray photo uh, photon energy as far as the Auger electron is concerned. However, in the binding energy scale Auger peak positions depend on the X-ray source we will also look at it shortly from now. When we look at a typical X-ray photo electron spectra then there are some notations spectroscopic notations which are uh, included and uh, they are actually summed up either as K L 1 L 2 L 3 or it is actually abbreviated as 1 s half 2 s half 2 p half 2 p 3 by 2. So, we need to understand in perspective what this exactly means the suffix that we are looking at is mainly coming from the j and j is nothing but spin orbit coupling. So, uh, where L is your orbital uh, momentum or uh, orb orbital angular momentum number quantum number therefore, the L and the spin of the electron will couple together and give half. For example, if your spin is half then 0 plus half will give you half if it is 0 in this case yeah if this is going to be 1 then 1 minus half will give you half or 1 minus 1 plus half will give 3 by 2. So, the suffix is actually uh, a product of uh, both uh, L plus S which is given denoted as J. Okay. So, depending on the shell we can abbreviate this as L 1 if we say L 1 then we talk about 2 S half L 2 is 2 p half L 3 is 2 p 3 by 2. So, by this way we can actually uh, map all the uh, shells or the electrons related to that particular shell and these are having very characteristic binding energy which we will see shortly from now. So, this is the spin orbit coupling that uh, we picked up from the earlier uh, uh, slide. So, the L s coupling is nothing but your um, J coupling 
uh, which is L plus or minus half. So, if L plus half is there then we talk about uh, half or uh, 3 by 2 or L minus half will be uh, half. So, this is the way it is denoted your 2 is nothing but your principal quantum number that determines which shell uh, the electron is involved uh, in, in the spectra and uh, this is to do with the uh, coupling. So, uh, if you are actually looking at a 2 p half or 2 p 3 by 2 uh, spectra then the, there will be certainly a ratio uh, of the area uh, for this peak. So, if we talk about 2 p 3 by 2 then the area under the curve will be approximately 2 times more than the 2 p half and similarly between 3 d 3 by 2 and 3 d 5 by 2 you will have a intensity ratio of 3 is to 2 and uh, same is the case for uh, 4 f electrons 4 f 5 by 2 and 4 f 7 by 2 will have a ratio of 3 is to 4. So, looking at this we can easily map even without a notation looking at the area under the peak we will be able to immediately say what is the sort of peak that we are looking at. So, typically the peak will look like this uh, and this is the case for gold 4 d 5 by 2 and gold 4 d 3 by 2 as I told you in the previous case that if it is a d electron then the ratio would be somewhere between 2 is to 3 and you can see that very well here and the area under this curve will be the measure. So, the separation between the two peaks are named as spin orbit coupling and the values of spin orbital uh, splitting of a core level of an element in different compounds are nearly the same. So, this splitting will nearly be the same for almost all the elements and the peak ratios of the core level of an element in different compounds are also nearly the same because it does not depend on the uh, material, but it depends on the uh, spin orbit coupling. So, th these are very unique uh, to the quantum states. Uh, so, what we can uh, identify therefore, is in spin orbit splitting the peak area will assist in uh, the element identifications. Now, how will uh, x-ray uh, photo electron spectra chamber look like? Um, the analyzer which will actually analyze the x-ray photo electron will actually be a semi hemispherical chamber and this is how it goes. If you have a x-ray source which is uh, hitting the target that is your sample. Now, electron is ejected out beyond the vacuum level and this is actually translated through a semi hemispherical uh, chamber which is uh, the inner uh, layer is actually coated with gold. So, out, outer uh, chamber might look metallic, but then it is actually plated with gold. So, gold is your, um, uh, your analyzer and this is actually channelized so as to get the uh, stuff directly to the detector through a photo multiplier tube. So, this is in essence a simple setup of a, a x-ray photo electron spectra, uh, spectrophotometer. So, because we are actually using an analyzer which is gold in this case, now this has to be since the uh, gold uh, is acting as an uh, reference uh, detector uh, where all the photo electrons are collected, the work function of the gold is also to be equated or grounded to the sample. Therefore, the Fermi level of both the sample and the analyzer has to be uh, same so, and as a result uh, we need to include the work function of uh, gold electrode also and this is a typical um, picture of a assembled analyzer that we are talking about. So, you would have the sample fitted here and then it will go through the detector and the photo electron uh, will be mapped. So, this is a cartoon that tells how simple or how intricate the assembly is made. Now, when we talk about uh, XPS energy scale uh, there are two things that we need to understand. One is the 
uh, XPS energy with respect to kinetic energy and the XPS energy scale with respect to binding energy two things are there. So, uh, when we talk about kinetic energy the expression that we follow is kinetic energy is equal to the incident energy of the uh, electron beam and the binding energy of your sample minus the work function of your spectrophotometer which is nothing but gold. So, we usually take the gold work function and we minus that because that is also uh, involved in the analyzing process. Um, photo electron uh, line energies therefore, are dependent on photon energy whereas, the Auger electron line energies are not dependent on photon energy this is a very important principle. So, only the XPS lines are dependent on the photon energy which we are talking about this and uh, the binding energy is not dependent on this H nu. So, why we use spectrophotometer work function because electrons are detected when reaching the detectors Fermi level kinetic energy is therefore, measured relative to the detectors 0 point that is why we use the work function and in addition sample may be uh, on a different potential that is it can be charged. Uh, when we talk about the energy scale in terms of binding energy then you will easily find out that we are talking now about uh, binding energy which is uh, equal to uh, H nu minus kinetic energy minus uh, phi spectro, uh, spectrometer. So, in this case the photo electron line energy is not dependent on uh, photon energy whereas, Auger electron is dependent on photon energy when we think about binding energy. Okay. So, the binding energy can be calibrated by standards typically we always use carbon 1s standard because when we are running the vacuum uh, system there will be some amount of carbon in the vacuum which will get deposited on the surface of the sample. Therefore, carbon impurity will always be there however, you treat your sample and therefore, carbon 1s which is coming from the vacuum chamber will actually serve as an internal standard. How much ever we try to flush out this uh, uh, sample yet we will see a very clear carbon 1s spectra and that is typically 285 uh, electron volt and that is uh, used as a reference point. And then we also have gold, gold 407 that is uh, 7 by 2 which appears at 84 as a reference point. If suppose this binding energies are differing by 1 electron volt or 2 electron volt then we need to use this as a correction factor when we are analyzing our uh, sample. So, uh, that is the way we do the two things that we saw is uh, the binding energy reference or the kinetic energy reference. Um, now, this is the process that we talked about uh, taking the electron from the core level to the Fermi level which is the binding energy plus the work function of the sample from where you take the um, electron from the Fermi level to the vacuum level and then this electron is actually put into the vacuum level of the uh, analyzer therefore, we are talking about the work function of the spectrophotometer. So, when we look at the kinetic energy of the photo electron then we are talking about H nu H nu minus B e minus the sample and similarly um, we have to take into consideration the uh, work function of the sample minus the uh, spectrophotometer. Therefore, uh, if we merge all these four parameters H nu minus B e minus phi sample minus the difference of sample and spectrophotometer then we boil down to this uh, expression. And similarly for binding energy we have this equation uh, H nu minus kinetic energy minus phi that is the reason why we have um, two different ways of evaluating the ejected electrons and this is a map which tells us the relative binding energy of different elements um, and uh, the 1s electrons uh, usually 
have a range between 0 to 1100 electron volt and uh, uh, this is for the atoms uh, with atomic number 0 to 10 and as you progressively increase then you can see all the binding energies uh, can be mapped the 2 s and 2 p and these are all very specific to the uh, core shell of different elements. So, uh, each uh, number will have a very precise count. So, there would not be uh, any change and uh, therefore, we can easily try to analyze uh, the local state of uh, each of this uh, metal or elements, uh, but when you go to higher energies as you can see here there are some gaps for 4 f and for 4 d electrons mainly coming because of uh, the heavier electrons and the screening and the penetration effect which will actually uh, distort the way the off bar principle describes. Therefore, uh, there, there are some uh, gaps here which uh, f for which we can see how we can account for those, uh, those regions mainly those are heavier metals therefore, you would see those um, missing data present here. Okay. So, bulkier the atoms then you have this off bar principle uh, dictating the binding energy. When we have a survey spectrum taken uh, for uh, indium phosphide for example, then these are the different peaks that one would see. And, uh, each peak and every hump that is shown here has some message to convey. For example, if you look at indium 3 d 5 by 2 um, and indium 3 d 3 by 2, these two peaks are coming because of the photo electrons without energy loss, whereas there will be a broadening or a small satellite feature that is coming, which is actually a background effect coming because of the photo electrons energy loss and uh, as you would see here you can pinpoint each of these peaks which is uh, characteristic for indium 3 s 3 p 3 d and uh, phosphorus 2 s 2 p and indium 4 d. So, each of this peak can be monitored precisely and this is a survey spectrum of a nickel foil which clearly gives you uh, the peak for 2 p and also for 3 s and 3 p electrons and in between you also see the ogier lines which are coming and typically you can you cannot avoid the ogier lines in a survey spectrum, but you can easily make out which is coming from a ogier spectra mainly because they will be asymmetric and it will be broad. So, those peaks which are asymmetric and broad are coming due to the ogier effect whereas, the sharp ones are due to the photo electron. So, in a survey spectrum you can easily pinpoint on those features and if you try to expand or enlarge this portion you can see this in the inset you can clearly get the nature of the peak whether it is symmetric or asymmetric and uh, what is the broadening and is there any other extra features that are coming all this can be seen when we try to expand this scale. So, every uh, satellite feature that you see to the primary feature will give some idea about the local state and uh, the oxidation uh, state of uh, those elements. Uh, one more thing that we need to understand why this is a surface technique is because of the sampling depth that is involved. The sampling depth is actually defined as the depth from which 95 percent of all photo electrons are scattered by the time they reach the surface. So, when uh, electrons are ejected the time taken or the uh, distance it travels by which by the time 95 percent of the photo electrons can be scattered is the sampling depth and that is um, of the order of 3 lambda. Most lambdas uh, wavelengths are in the range of 1.12. 3.5 nanometer for a alpha uh, aluminum k alpha radiation. Usually, we use aluminum k alpha or magnesium k alpha as the radiation for XPS. So, the sampling depth is uh, approximately 3 lambda for XPS under this condition. Therefore, your sampling depth can be uh, ascertained to be anywhere between 3 to 10 nanometers. 
and that is all we can probe. One of the very useful information that you get uh, from XPS is the uh, oxidation state. We will see several examples in the next few slides where we will uh, we can understand what uh, what are the intricacies as we study those numbers. Um, this is the case for lithium metal and this is the case for uh, lithium oxide. As you see here the binding energy is actually lower for lithium metal because uh, of the increased screening of the 2 s electrons and uh, therefore, the binding energy will always be on the lower side and that is what you see here in the 2 peak spectrum. If you have lithium oxide and lithium metal together then you see 2 peaks coming one corresponding to lithium metal and the higher binding energy peak is actually corresponding to lithium oxide and that is because the LA, uh, lithium 2 s electron has been uh, given to oxygen in the bonding and therefore, the binding energy is much more stronger for lithium oxide. So, you would get a 2 peak spectra which clearly tells what is the uh, center and what is the coordination site that is involved uh, in this compounds. So, examples of other chemical shifts we can see here. Uh, this is a compound with with the fluorine uh, as uh, uh, substituted groups and then you have uh, carbon hydrogen bonds, carbon oxygen bonds. So, uh, clearly we have three different range of uh, substitutions in this uh, polymer and uh, if you take a X, XPS spectra you can clearly find out that carbon 1s spectra will have 3 peaks and all these 3 peaks correspond to different uh, bonding. Cf will give at a very higher uh, binding energy than Co than Ch. So, clearly the peak separation suggests that there are 3 different uh, sets of carbon uh, that is present and similarly you take a spectra of uh, silicon. Uh, in comparison with silicon fluoride of different fluorine substitutions SIF or SIF 2, SIF 3, SIF 4 then you can clearly see the silicon um, spectra gives uh, different features and this is what we call as satellite feature these two are called as satellite features and if we properly deconvolute then we can quantify what is actually present in this sample. So, if you map this uh, in each case for example, silicon uh, the oxidation state is 0 and then silicon fluoride oxidation state is 1, silicon uh, F 2 is actually uh, 2 plus silicon F 3 here 3 plus. So, if you make a, a comparison between the core shell shift here versus the oxidation state it is actually linear and as you would see here for each oxidation state the increase in the uh, core shell shift is by the order of 1 electron volt. So, roughly we can take this to heart that for every oxidation state the jump would be approximately 1 electron volt. So, if carbon or uh, any other element for example, oxygen uh, is 2 minus if you are looking for oxygen 1 minus then you would only see a difference of around 1 electron volt or less than 1 electron volt there it cannot be 2 then there is something else which is happening. Therefore, uh, this, uh, this uh, calibration clearly gives you an idea that it has to be somewhere around 1 electron volt for a change uh, in oxidation state by uh, plus 1 or minus 1. <coughs> uh, this is another case. Uh, if you have CF4 or CO2 or CH4 as we saw from the previous graph, we can clearly see the carbon 1s uh, peaks are shift, shifted, core level um, chemical shifts these are related to the overall change on the atom and the reduced charge which means increased binding energy. There are number of substitute, substituents which can be evident from the number of peaks, the electronegativity of the substitution also is magnified between oxygen, fluorine and hydrogen. So, the shift is uh, very clear and the formal oxidation state can also be traced. In fact, for many of the organic compounds or 
material with organic substitutions just like IR which gives fingerprint region, so is the case for um, these functional groups. Um, in the case of carbon nitrogen single bond you can see 286, in the case of uh, keto group or ester group it is 289 and when we go for uh, fluorocarbons it is 290 and when we go for complete substitution of CF3 you can go to 293. As you see here the range of shift in the binding energy for car carbon 1 is can vary up to 285 to 293 which is nearly 12 electron volt and that totally depends on the substitution that is going along with the carbon atoms. So, uh, this can become a very useful tool uh, because as I told you carbon 1 s 285 is a very good calibrant uh, which is the um, hydrocarbon. So, compared to that any other functional groups that are there you can easily pick out uh, selectively which particular carbon atom is there. For example, if you take a compound which is hygroscopic it will also absorb carbon dioxide. So, it will form carbonates. So, easily you can map based on the position of your carbon 1 s whether it is a uh, ca carbonate uh, impurity is present. So, the core level chemical shift for uh, carbon 1 s uh, can be easily found out and therefore, the chemical environment can easily be assigned ascertained in our materials. In the next example we will take example of uh, metal oxide in comparison with the pure metal and try to see what is the approximate shift and what is the nature of shift that you can expect. As you can see here this is a uh, iron 2 p spectra and uh, in this case you can see metallic iron actually shows a much sharper peak, but once we talk about uh, oxides or iron oxide then we see a more broader peak and the difference between the iron oxide peak uh, F e 2 p peak. Uh, from that of the pure metal is approximately of 3 electron volt and this 3 electron volt suggests that the oxidation state of iron actually has shifted from 0 to plus 3. And similarly let us take the case of uh, a partially oxidized magnetite and if you map the Fe 2 p line spectra of this magnetite you would find out apart from the Fe 3 peak which is uh, visible here very clearly you also see a small inflection and there is a asymmetry in the XPS peak. The moment we see asymmetry in the peak then we got to be cautious the baseline shift here can actually come from many issues which we will also see, but one of the things that we need to find out is the sort of a satellite feature that is bent here and if we try to deconvolute we would see a proportion of uh, this peak and a smaller proportion of this peak coming into picture which suggests that it is partially converted to F e 2 plus. So, the nature uh, of the uh, XPS peak will clearly tell us not only about the proportion, but also about the uh, <coughs> mixed valence states. Take for example, the case of uh, oxygen 1 s spectrum. And in the case of metal oxide you would see a very clear oxygen 1 s whereas, because of surface hydration you will also see a satellite peak which is coming. So, you can easily map whether the iron oxide is pure or it is having some water of hydration associated with it. Similarly, in the case of uh, uh, cubic boron nitrate crystal if you try to take this crystal and look at the boron 1 s or nitrogen 1 s you would be uh, confused with the sort of spectra that you are seeing here. Mainly such a unsymmetric broad spectrum is coming because of the surface impurity and in the case of boron nitride you would actually have a oxide uh, impurity which brings about this broadening and this multiplet feature. And similarly the case of nitrogen you can see that there is a ambiguity there. What you do here is as a protocol in XPS before we map the 1 s or 2 s or 2, 2 p spectra as a uh, regular protocol it is suggested to sputter the sample with 
200 electron volt argon uh, ions and this puttering actually is bound to remove all the surface uh, prop, uh, uh, occlusions or uh, adsorbed molecules. Therefore, after sputtering you can clearly see that the boron 1 s is giving a very sharp uh, Gaussian peak. Similarly, nitrogen 1 s gives a very resolved peak. Therefore, it is very important when we study XPS that we just do not uh, map your uh, spectra rather you do the surface treatment in the first place. But one should also understand this argon sp sputtering can modify the oxidation states of the elements which are already present. Therefore, we need to be very careful to have a rough idea about um, such an impact of the uh, of the sputtering uh, ions uh, on the sample. Therefore, if we look for uh, look for uh, mixed valency then we need to be doing this in a much more careful way. But generally the argon sputtering will try to take out all the surface impurities which are settled on the sample. Uh, Let us take the case of aluminum oxide, uh, aluminum oxide uh, actually we can not only map the, the trivalent state or the zero valency in this case the metal and the aluminum oxide clearly shows a two peak spectra. So, we know that uh, both aluminum oxide and aluminum is there, but apart from that we also get to see that the oxide th thickness can be mapped which is of the order of 3.7 nanometer. How do we do that? Uh, we have already seen uh, what is the uh, length uh, depth that we can scan which is ranging up to 10 nanometer. Based on that when the oxide is actually 9 nanometers it is possible to distinguish the contribution from both the oxide and metal photo electrons and uh, the uh, expression that is given here is d which is the depth or the thickness of the oxide layer which is given by 2.8 ln 1.4 um, and uh, this is the ratio of your uh, oxide versus the metal photoelectron peaks. Therefore, we can actually quantify what is the amount of surface oxidation that has occurred on an aluminum foil. So, uh, XPS can actually give you a quantized picture of uh, that situation. We will also look at some more examples uh, of mixed valence states in mixed metal uh, it is actually metal oxides. Uh, take uh, for example, the perovskites the transition metal 2 p bands uh, showing both plus 3 and plus 4 states. The first peak what we see here in this case is actually coming from the plus uh, 3 state and then we also see a satellite feature. So, for all uh, compounds uh, whether it is ferrites or manganites or cobaltites we can always look at the mixed valence states of the B cation uh, and therefore, this can become a very useful way to um, analyze it and as you see here uh, when we have mixed valency the 2 p 3 by 2 is asymmetric with the satellite feature therefore, one has to deconvolute uh, this spectra in order to quantify how much of 3 plus and how much of 4 plus ions are there. And uh, similarly in this case all the perovskite uh, compounds like uh, lanthanum nickelate, lanthanum ferrite, lanthanum venidate all this show asymmetry related to the 3 plus and 4 plus states. Um, here is another cartoon which gives us a range of uh, oxides starting from LaMnO3. Um, cobaltites, uh, ferrites everything can be mapped. For example, uh, these two compounds can serve as a standard when we are specially uh, analyzing uh, mixed valent compounds or substituted ones. As you know here a pure LaMnO3 actually should have Mn in 3 plus, but when you substitute calcium uh, in the lanthanum site Mn3 and Mn4 ratio will be present. So, how do we map that? we can take the individual spectra of Mn 2 O 3 which is predominantly 3 plus and Mn O 2 which is predominantly 4 and therefore, these two can act as a standard to find out how much of 3 and 4 is present and looking at the peak positions we can clearly map whether the 3 4 combination exists. 
Similarly, in the case of uh, uh, ferrites, we can use Fe2O3 as a standard to uh, see how much of uh, reduction in the oxidation state or oxidation has happened from Fe3 to Fe4. And uh, here again, there are uh, other uh, uh, examples given. Uh, only thing in this case, it's about uh, K absorption H. Therefore, you can see the values are much less because we are talking about K shell. So, uh, this can uh, the K absorption H can also serve as a useful number when we try to map between substituted ones and the parent uh, perovskite oxides. When we look at the XPS, there are other advantages uh, that we have. Uh, for example, if we look at lanthanum nickelate and uh, uh, substituted with uh, more than two metal ions, all that we can observe from the lanthanum 4D 5 by 2 and 4D 3 by uh, 2, you can see here hardly there is any change. In other words, the uh, lanthanum valency is not affected in the process when substitution is going on. Therefore, rare earth uh, uh, positions, peak positions can also serve as a internal standard because they do not exhibit mixed valency except for praseodymium which shows 2 plus, 6 plus and 4 plus uh, oxidation state. Lanthanum in general can show a very precise number and so is the case for oxygen 1s you would hardly see any change happening unless or otherwise a peroxo species is present. So, when we have this perovskite compounds uh, taking a look at lanthanum and oxygen position itself can be a useful calibrant uh, to see whether the effect is predominantly coming from the mixed valence states. So, the features of uh, such uh, XPS spectras are given here. And uh, uh, this, this can also be used for a methodical uh, study. For example, if we are going to make a systematic substitution of zirconium into ceria, then this can use as uh, this technique can be a very successful one. As you would see here uh, with substitution of zirconium, you can see this 890 uh, EV peak is actually decreasing in intensity. Why? Because zirconium is in uh, 4 plus and cerium can actually exist in both 4 as well as 3. So, when you substitute zirconium then the there is a fallout of one of the oxidation states of cerium as a result you can clearly see a systematic trend and so is the case for zirconium you can see the position uh, or the peak intensity varying uh, as we substitute in ceria. So, uh, we can clearly map or make a uh, very detailed study uh, especially when we are looking at solid solutions of two uh, dissimilar metals. And uh, similarly, um, XPS has been used uh, almost to crack the chemistry behind uh, the superconductors and uh, I will be dealing with the superconducting oxides in one of the um, lectures uh, in module 5. Uh, but here quickly I want to bring out the usefulness of uh, X-ray uh, photoelectron spectra in elucidating the electronic states of the copper valency for example. In the case of the 34 K superconductor which is lanthanum strontium cuprate compared with the 90 K superconductor the conductivity as we see both are metallic, but if you look at the formal valence of um, both uh, the 34 K and 90 K superconductor this is actually nearly the same compared to a semiconductor and uh, the formal valence also goes beyond to suggest that copper is not exactly in copper 2 plus, but it is in a higher valence state. So, if you make a comparison with a standard compound which is copper uh, cupric chloride um, which is a well studied system and if we try to reposition this to match with the copper 2 p uh, core level spectra, you can clearly see that there is uh, the copper 2 p 3 by 2 and 2 p half uh, spectra they are both divided. In other words, they show a split in each peak. So, the split in each peak clearly shows that copper is not remaining totally in copper 2 plus, but 
a part of copper 2 plus is oxidized to copper 3 plus and that is happening in order to uh, bring the electric uh, uh, charge neutrality into this uh, lattice and uh, therefore, this valence state of copper 2 plus and copper 3 plus has really helped the um, community uh, to ascertain what is the conduction mechanism which actually drives this uh, superconducting oxides to show absolute uh, zero resistance. So, XPS is a very useful tool therefore, to provide the mechanism in a much more elegant way and uh, this is another example which I will be talking about in uh, module 1 uh, under combustion synthesis where noble metal ionic catalyst has been proved to be existing because if you think of any ca catalyst with noble metals like uh, platinum on silica, platinum on ceria or platinum on alumina it is always recognized that these noble metals are in zero valence state and that is why they they show very high efficiency in converting the effluent gases in automobile exhaust. So, till today most of the companies are using this uh, platinum um, coated uh, solid supports for um, catalytic conversion, but what has been found recently that if you take platinum and actually treat it with ceria in a, in a combustion mode platinum is not actually sitting on the surface, but it is actually getting precisely doped to um, in, in the cerium site and as you would see here very clearly these are the uh, valence bands uh, spectra for uh, platinum, palladium and other noble metal uh, metals whereas, when palladium is actually doped into ceria you can see the spectra is completely different from the noble metals. So, what it suggests that platinum is actually getting doped and it is in 2 plus state and because of that one can see that 2 percent and uh, 1 percent platinum doped in titania shows a tremendous increase in the conversion compared to the undoped ceria state. So, a mechanism has been very clearly elucidated based on XP spectra where the substitution of this noble metal precisely into ceria and the valence state has been ascertained using XPS spectra. And similarly, uh, if you take a alloy and then try to see uh, what is the influence of uh, doping uh, gold uh, along with al aluminum, we can clearly find out that uh, if we have gold then the oxidation of aluminum to aluminum hydroxide or aluminum uh, oxide can be inhibited largely because of uh, this alloy formation with gold. Uh, so, if you take the XP spectra of aluminum and you do a comparison with the aluminum gold alloy you can clearly see that the conversion rate is much faster in this case compared to gold alloyed aluminum. So, um, when we try to look at the uh, degradation process of alloys XPS again can prove very useful. So, in uh, next few slides I just leave with uh, some parameters which we need to bear in mind what to look for and what not to look for or what to avoid in XPS data. Number one um, as we know that we are looking at the splitting and as a result we are mapping the unusual oxidation states and we will also be observing the auger lines in the XPS spectra, but apart from that we will also get X-ray satellites and surface charging effects intrinsic satellite effects all this can come into picture. So, one has to be careful while trying to analyze the nature of XP spectra. For example, surface charging can become a very important issue when a specimen neutralizer is actually on you can see A this is the peak due to Al2O3 and this is due to aluminum metal, but once you remove the specimen neutralizer because of the surface charging this peak actually gets shifted here, but the aluminum peak will remain the same, but this peak has actually moved here. So, we need to be very careful about the charging effects which can totally mislead our analysis and also uh, the XPS data analysis has to be viewed carefully. Now, we can try to uh, use the peak area analysis in this way 
or we can just draw a baseline this way and try to analyze, but what is actually expected is a optimization of your baseline which has to be in this form. Now, there are several softwares which can help us in adjusting the baseline correction, so that the area under this peak can be mapped to quantify the amount of this oxidation state that is present. Therefore, the peak analysis or the deconvoluted uh, peaks need to be analyzed with proper precision. So, um, this can prove to be a very useful technique especially uh, when uh, you play with the heavier metals. Uh, so, more than organic samples the inorganic samples have taken a much better attention as far as XPS um, is concerned and lot more information can be drawn uh, with the XPS and uh, this can be quantified. So, this is one of the spectroscopy where it is not only quant qualitative, but it is also a quantitative picture. In the next few uh, uh, lectures we will also look at other spectroscopic tools which can be used for surface analysis.